on an all-new Dr. Phil. She believes people are watching her. Barack Obama, I feel like, is one of my warriors. You started showering in a swimsuit. I felt like I could hear her cat calls from across the pond. Her ex claims her voyeurs. You've never seen one. It's in her head. Tore their marriage apart. You are hearing voices that told you what? Just leave him. You're too good for him. Stop. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Two and a half years ago, Andrew says his marriage to Lacey was torn apart when she left him for another man. Well, actually, not just one man, a whole bunch of them. Well, wait a minute. It's not what you think. These men are actually what Lacey calls voyeurs, people she believes are spying on her and speaking all day long to her from across a pond. Now, Lacey claims these voyeurs are a group of men and some girls who not only convinced her to divorce Andrew, but caused her to move to another apartment and cover her vents with newspapers. Now, they even told her to contact me, which she did. Now, Lacey says it has gotten so bad that she has had to shower in a bathing suit because she believes that her voyeurs are watching her. Now, you'll hear some of this and you'll think, wow, that's just wild. But I can assure you it is very real to her. It is very serious to her. Take a look. For the past five years, I think people have been watching me and I hear their voices. I feel completely violated by them. I started calling them voyeurs. I have up to 50 voyeurs, and I do talk to them out loud on a daily basis. I hear voices coming from outside. I hear voices coming from these woods as well. I feel like they're coming somewhere from like the hood area. I hear them telling me that my kitchen needs to be cleaned. My voyeurs are harassing, rude. I hear them yelling the word at me a lot. I've had voices since we started this interview. I have heard the sound of a man making like an elk bugle. I know that's weird, but I think like the original group of voyeurs were like hunter type of guys. This all started shortly after having my daughter. I heard people from a house across the I've heard them make comments about my body. Some of these voices would make comments about me breastfeeding my child, saying things like, it's feeding time. I think that people have figured some way of bugging my home. I just undid these screws and took this plate off. I was hoping I would find a camera, but obviously never did. For a period of time, I was wearing bathing suits when I showered. My parents are really adamant that I'm making this up. My sister doesn't believe me. My boyfriend, Andrew, is closed-minded to the situation, and he really doesn't believe me. In the spring of 2015, the voices started to really encourage me to not be with Andrew. Andrew lost it, filed for divorce. He kicked me out. Two years later, we got back together, and I'm comfortable with remarrying him. I know it's crazy to say these things out loud, but in my heart, I believe that it's true. All right, Lacey, um, good to meet you. Tell me when you decided that this was happening. When's your first recollection of this? Um, probably in the summer of 2013. Okay, and what, what was going on at that time? I did have a daughter and got married. And when was your daughter born? March of 2013. And what were the first messages you heard? Probably something like, we're watching you. It didn't really like, it wasn't clear at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I just heard these voices, but I couldn't quite understand them. The kind of mumbling? Yeah. And didn't you say they were positive at first? 
Yeah, the tone was more positive. Uh, a lot of compliments, or sounded like compliments, and then also inappropriate. Um, like if I was taking a bath, uh -huh. compliments on my body, which is technically positive, but <laughs> okay. invasive. And are all of these voices you hearing, that you're hearing coming from outside your head instead of inside your head? Yeah, coming from outside of my head, or at least I believe that. And there's some kind of electronic device or my apartment is bugged in some way and I can hear just the slightest sound of voices mm -hmm. through things like vents. Well, you thought there were high-powered binoculars, infrared, mm -hmm. and they were looking at you through those. Yeah. And you think that their base of operations is across this pond? Correct, yes. Okay, so there's a house across the pond. Yes. And you think they're looking at you from there? Correct. Okay. Now, question. Why you? I don't, I don't know. My, what I'm thinking, um, what makes sense in my head, is that um, Andrew started working mm -hmm. at a cell phone, a company that works on cell phone towers. Um, we started meeting his coworkers, and they were really hard on Andrew, and he was he had very little experience with manual labor and working with tools. Um, they were really hard on him and didn't like him. Um, and they met our family at a picnic, particularly one time at a company picnic. And I think that these coworkers started it um, out of like jealousy almost in a way. And it grew from there, from just from that group of people people started to realize this is easy and we're getting away with it and it's kind of fun to do when we're just hanging out. And more people started to uh, How many it. Macs do you think are involved here? It's, you know, hard to say, but I, th I threw a number on it, like 20 to 50 mm -hmm. in my head. It's mm -hmm. hard to differentiate between the voices. Mm -hmm. But, so you must be pretty important. Right, you'd think so. I know. And that's the, the position some family members have taken. Like, why do you think you're so important that people would line up? And when I've sat down with a psychologist, that was a point he made. Like, people aren't st standing in line to watch you, you know. But, but you have to reality test these things, right? You have to right. say, I mean, common sense, you have to start asking if, if, you know, if, if minimum wage even is $10 an hour, and there's 50 people watching you, then that's $500 an hour times eight hours a day. You know, now you're talking $4,000 per eight hour shift. And there's three eight hour shifts. You're talking about $24,000 a day to watch you. Mm -hmm. I know, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, I, I wouldn't watch me for... <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I do want you to watch me. I... <laughs> For, but it's free if you watch me, so it's okay. Uh, Lacey says there's a demand for black market voyeur footage on the internet, so it's no surprise that her entire life is being streamed and watched by up to 50 people, some of whom she claims are sexual predators. But her ex-husband says, look, this is just all nonsense. He doesn't believe it. He thinks it doesn't make common sense. He says he's not going to go there. He's gone there before. He's not going there again. Well, we're going to meet him after the break. these voices from all around here. She thinks that there's people outside in the woods with cameras. Are you hearing any voices right now? Um, I'm hearing some voices from like that direction. This is impossible. You can't see through the trees. And later. The last five years I've kind of been drugged through the dirt here. I'm sitting here on the Dr. Phil show. It's like, stop. Just stop and look around. Look at how everybody's looking at us right now. Barack Obama, I feel like, is one of my voyeurs. I can't even believe myself when I say that out loud. I haven't heard him very often, but I, I think I've heard him say, hey, it's Barack Obama. When I first heard him, it just makes me feel very sick and schizophrenic because it's just not believable. 
Imagine complete strangers watching your every move all day, every day. Well, Lacey says that's exactly what has been happening to her for the last five years. Lacey says she wants to remarry Andrew after the voices told her to divorce him. Says she didn't want to, but they told her that she needed to. But he says, now I'm fed up with being the other man in Lacey's life. Let's hear what he has to say. Lacey's so-called voyeurs are really affecting our relationship, and I don't really think that they're real. She had mentioned that she could hear him coming from the vents in our house, so I took all the vents off. I actually went through and pulled off the light pictures and went through everything. This is Lacey's journey through the house. I'm not gonna get much of a microphone into that. I've taken it out, there's nothing there. No cameras. Taking one of these out. These things wouldn't work if there's anything in them. I pulled this off, the lighting fixture here, and then I pulled this down just to see if there's a camera or a listening device or anything. Never found it. Lacey's voices are distractions, they're non-existent, and they affect her relationship with me and my daughter. Lacey's hard to get along with, <laughs> and, and she is a bit of a narcissist. I avoid the topic of the voyeurs like it's the plague. It is irrational, and it's just something that I just don't even want to feed into. That's our apartment. You can't even see into it, and she thinks there's people over there that are listening to her and watching her, and there's no way, there's, you can't see them, they're 500 yards away. Once we had a third birthday party for my daughter, whenever she would mention a word that began with V, these so-called voyeurs, it would just eat into my skin, and I just lost it and started screaming at her, and I kind of shook her a little bit. I was like, they're not real, they're not there, they're not true, and I overreacted, and I made a scene. I don't want to tiptoe around this problem anymore. I love her with all my heart, but I just can't stand it. She says she wants to remarry, I'm not doing it again, because who knows what's down the road's gonna come from these voices. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It's not gonna happen again. Well, Andrew says that Lacey believes that there are not only hidden cameras and recording devices all over their apartment, but she's even being watched and spoken to by voyeurs living in the woods. Yeah, I just hear voices coming from here. She thinks that there's people outside in the woods with cameras watching the inside of our apartment. Whenever I'm on my deck or out in the back, I always am hearing uh, these voices from all around here. There are homeless people that live in the woods, but they're not the type of people that would be installing cameras and voice recording things and speakers in our apartments. Do you hear any voices right now? Um, I'm hearing some voices from like that direction. It's hard to make out, but I heard my name. Like encouragement. Just a lot of yeah, Lacey. I'm hearing, yeah, like some people out here. Yeah, I'm hearing them. I mean, this sounds insane, but I feel like officers know this is happening and they can't do anything to prove it. This is where we used to live. This is where it all began. Guys were hanging out over here and they caught on to the fact that you could see into our apartment pretty easily. The house is behind those trees. This is impossible. You can't see in the window through the trees. There's, it's just, it's impossible. I confronted the person and he denied it. We drove to the house across the pond and confronted them. They just looked at us like we were clueless. She was like crying off and on through the whole thing and it was just a really awkward situation. Andrew, thanks for being here. Thanks for um, having me. What do you think's going on? It's in her head. There's no physical evidence that there's actually anybody speaking to her. But these voices became so prominent that it actually led to a divorce, right? Yes. And because they told you what about why get rid of him? Um, just to leave him. You're too good for him. Your behavior changed after these voyeurs became part of your perception. You started showering in a swimsuit. For a little period of time, Because yeah. you thought you were being observed. Mm -hmm. So in all modesty, you thought, you know, somebody watching me, I'm going to keep some clothes on. Andrew says he's done everything to find their surveillance equipment Lacey believes is monitoring her 24 hours a day. So what has he found? And then I've got some questions for Lacey here. We'll be right back. When I was driving, I could hear them coming from vents. The voyeurs would tell me to go to bars. I would ask people sitting next to me if 
they were possibly my voyeurs. And later... I feel really violated and I want to stop hearing this. Do you like the attention? If they're not real, I'm not really getting attention. You're avoiding the question. To get away from the voyeurs, I would close my blinds, always lock the door, play the television loud, play loud music when I was in the shower, anything that would drown out voices. In the past, I have covered my bathroom vents with newspaper. My mother made a comment, oh, you poor girl, you're so paranoid. Well, Lacey says you spent two years driving around in search to finally put a face behind the voices. For a year and a half, I've been driving around looking for voyeurs. When I was driving, I could hear them coming from vents again. This house, I think I hear voices from. They might hang out here. The voyeurs tried to set up meeting points so I could find them. They would give standard commands, left, right, go straight. My voyeurs would congregate around here in this park. I would hear them tell me to go to bars. I would sometimes go up to people or ask people sitting next to me if they were possibly my voyeurs or if they knew anything about it. It never led to any answers. Okay, now tell me this. You've gone to places that you've been told to go. Yes. To meet these folks. Okay, and when you got there, nobody's there. Right. How do you reconcile that in your mind? Playing just tricks on you, being mean to you, what? That they just don't care, like they're playing tricks, that they're too shy or um, whatever. But like I try to tell myself it's not real, obviously, but I just cannot like shake the belief. Okay, but how did they feel about you getting back around Andrew at this time? How are these voices, what do they say about that? I, I assume that's not a happy time. Yeah, just, uh, right, I hear things like, You've, you're making a huge mistake. Um, why did you go back to him? Why did you? I went back to him because I realized that these voices are never going to be, like, they're never gonna conceptualize and I don't think they're ever gonna stop. And um, Andrew is really, like, all that I have. And I do love him. Okay. You said no, they involved. are never going to be happy. So define they for me. Who uh, are they? I don't even know. Intellectually, you can look at this and can make a case for it being untrue. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Because you say, come on, $24,000 a day to watch me? Correct. Uh, come on. Yes. Uh, in the time that this has been going on, You've never seen one, right? Correct. Correct. So intellectually, you know you don't have any evidence yeah. that they exist. Intellectually, you know that, correct? Correct. Okay, and people are saying you're narcissistic about it because it's kind of grandiose to think that, yeah. I mean, I have paparazzi follow me around, and not 50 of them. Mm-hmm. So at the core, you've got a voice telling you, yeah. and this is the voice I asked you about early on, your inner voice telling you, this isn't happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, it is happening to her, or else she wouldn't have spent the last five years doing everything. You know what I mean? There's oh, something, no, like, there's no, 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 no physical no, no, don't way, get but there's definitely delusion. something that's like pulling you her into this. You said it is like, happening to her. It's yeah. not happening to her but she's distorting reality that it's happening it's to her. It's so much that it's, it's real. I mean, like, she sits there and just talks to people like they're there, but they're not there. Mm. Like, even our daughter comes through and she says, Mom, stop, you know, and she's five years old. She spends the whole day, she, you know, she'll sit there and twirl her hair and look at the internet. You come home, she's furious because nothing's done, but she's been talking to these people like they're there, they're not there. Okay. I'm so gonna unlock that frustration for you in just a second. Because what you're saying is perception is reality, yeah. and she perceives it to be real, so for her it is. Yeah, so how do we approach that? Good question. <laughs> Good que that's, the, that's the question, right? Now, we're going to take a break, and then I'm going to answer that question, because there is an answer. Now, Lacey was convinced that voyeurs at a house across the pond were peeping on her. 
but she says she could never find any proof. Well, we decided to go find out for ourselves. So we made contact with a man in that house. We're going to find out what he has to say after the break, because I want data, not opinion. We'll be right back. I'm a private investigator. I've been trained to find cameras, listening devices, and homes. If there's one there, I will find it. Closed captioning provided by... Right now, Andrew and I are romantically intimate two or three times a month. The voices and the behavior have led to a divorce, and now she's back. I just don't want to be intimate with Lacey. The voyeurs talk to me when I'm trying to be intimate making comments about my performance, good or bad, and making comments on his performance. The last thing I want to do is to be intimate. Well, I'm back with Lacey, who is adamant that her house has been bugged, so we decided to send a licensed investigator with over 32 years of experience working with various agencies, including the FBI, to conduct a thorough inspection of Lacey and Andrew's home to see what he could find. Take a look. My name is Bill Kepler. I'm a private investigator. I've been an investigator since 2005. Before then, I was a detective, been in law enforcement for 32 years. I've been trained to find cameras, listening devices, and homes and the outside areas. And if there's one there, I will find it. You said that you may be bugged. How do you know that? I just feel like that's what I'm hearing something through is some kind of device. I've looked through the hood of the stove and I've looked into like the heaters, but I've never found anything. I'll see what I can find for you. I looked in uh, Lacey's attic. Nothing that would suggest a listening devices or even speakers. Lacey mentioned that she heard voices coming from the vents throughout the house. There are no listening devices in any of the vents that I found in each of the rooms. Nobody would be viewing her inside the apartment from those apartments over there. After investigating all the statements Lacey made about hearing voices, feeling that people are watching her, I cannot cooperate any of those statements. Well, we also sent Bill on a mission to find the man Lacey claims she spoke to at a house across the pond. Let's take a look at that. I wanted to introduce myself. I'm a private investigator hired by Dr. Phil in his show to uh, check into uh, some statements from a female that lived in an apartment complex just north of you. Okay and alleged that uh, somebody was watching her from here. I remember the incident with, that you reminded me of, and uh, it seems like more than three years ago, a lot more. I do remember uh, somebody coming over here, a girl who seemed uh, despondent and kind of loony, um, said that people over here were looking at her, and people over there in the townhouses were watching her, and, I don't know if you can see, but it's 300 some yards from here to over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we, you know, just disregarded it as uh, as a little bit off. Do you know of anybody that was using binox to look over there or, or a telescope uh, or anything like that? We don't even have any binoculars. I believe that there's no way anybody could view Lacey while she's in the apartment from the house, which is about 300 to 350 yards away. Lacey, what are your thoughts on what's being said here? Um, I just, I believe him, and I, I know he's being truthful and honest, and um, I, yeah, this is about what I expected to happen. I believe that people do not do anything in a pattern without a payoff. What are you getting out of this? Well, obviously, I have not gotten anything out of this. Well, okay, wait a second. Stop. But... You wouldn't be doing this over and over if you weren't getting something out of it. If this was like slamming your hand in the car door, mm -hmm. if you hated this intrusion on your life, assume hypothetically that you wouldn't be doing it. What would be your payoff? Why are you doing this? What are you getting out of it? 
if you don't like the way an argument is going or something. Like, well, my voice has told me, like, well, good, that's great. I mean, this is kind of like the devil made me do it. Closed captioning provided by... I'm asking you, what is your payoff for embracing the belief that you're being observed? I don't know. Um, Do you like the attention? No. And I'm not, I mean, if they're not real, I'm not really getting attention because nobody's like. But they are, though. They're giving you, you know, but they're I, real I was out of town a lot. I was working, I was gone. There's nobody there. You're, Friends weren't coming over to like help raise this baby. Right. You wanted a tribe, and so this, these voices and gave you a tribe, and that's why I've always kind of like been like, "This is I what think, it is." It's yeah, and I think it like it started off as me liking the attention when it was like I felt like I could hear cat calls being yelled at me from across the pond. What are you getting out of it? Nothing. That's not true, or you wouldn't be doing it. Like I'm not really sure what the payoff is. It's just causing a lot of stress in my <clears throat> life. It's a good avoidance technique, isn't it? I mean, you, if you don't like the way an arg argument is going or something, does she use oh, it? Oh, it wins it every time. <laughs> it's she, a good escape mechanism, like, Well, my right? voice has told me, like, well, good, that's great. I mean, this is kind of like the devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. The last five years, I've kind of been drugged through the dirt here. I'm sitting here on the Dr. Phil show talking to you about something well, hey, that works. that's worked. not the bottom of the barrel. Well, no, What's no. It? <laughs> that's not what I mean. You understand, I, I'm sitting here in front of a live studio audience, in front of World God and everybody else, telling you the same thing I've been saying for the last five years, and that is that these aren't real, mm -hmm. and they're using them to, to get attention. I mean, you've just taken it so far that it's like, stop. Just stop and look around. Look at how everybody's looking at us right now. Joining us now is a member of the Dr. Phil Advisory Board, it's Dr. Charles Sophie. Uh, he is a board-certified uh, psychiatrist in three clinical specialties, adult psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, and family practice. And uh, Dr. Sophie is a medical director for the Department of Child and Family Services here in Los Angeles. First off, the term schizophrenia, do you think that is applicable to this situation in any way whatsoever? I don't. I don't. I mean, you're not losing touch with reality. You know the date, the time, you know where you're at all the time. Mm -hmm. You're able to bathe and eat and all that? Right, yes. But yeah. it is disturbed. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> there is a big difference between people that hear voices that are psychotic mm -hmm. and people that hear voices that are just what we call hearers. And you show no signs of psychosis that I can see. Do you see signs of psychosis here? No, nope, not at all. And it sounds funny, but there is a word. It's called hearers. You are a hearer. You are hearing voices that nobody else is hearing. Yes. But you don't have signs of psychosis. Okay. That's good news. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's a good thing, because there are other things that could come with that that would be right. very disruptive to your life. Yes. Okay? The good news is you are not crazy. You've gotten caught in a loop here that we need to break the cycle on. I would highly recommend, which, again, I'm not a big fan of, is that we try and find that medication that is biochemically targeted to help you resist that resistible impulse. And I also think it's important for you to find ways to soothe yourself. And I would recommend biofeedback training for that reason, where you learn to monitor your body and calm yourself. Because when you are in a completely calm state, completely relaxed state, I think you're going to find that the volume goes way, way down on this stuff. I mm -hmm. think you are sleep deprived. I think you are biochemically in, a, in heterostasis. And I think you don't know how to get into a really calm state. And I think if we do those three things, I think we will yeah. take some giant steps forward in a short period of time. And I'm prepared to provide you with the help you need to do all three of those things starting immediately. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Next, what if I told you that you could improve your health and slow aging with just the power of your mind? 
Well, according to a very good friend of mine, Dr. Dan Siegel, you can, and it only takes seven minutes a day. We're going to meet him and find out how after the break. Well, joining me now is one of my really good friends. Not only is he a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine and the executive director of the Mindside Institute, he's also a New York Times best-selling author. He's lectured for the King of Thailand, Pope John Paul II, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Now, I'm proud to say he is also a member of our Dr. Phil Advisory Board. His latest book, Aware, the science and practice of presence can help you make real and positive changes to the molecules in your body for a better life, and he's here to tell us how. So please welcome Dr. Dan Siegel. Okay. Robin and I find this absolutely intriguing, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly me, because uh, you're talking about slowing the aging process. Yes. <laughs> and I get up every morning and start looking more and more like an old catcher's mitt. So uh, uh, tell me about this. You say this is a hands-on guide uh, to be more focused, uh, present, energized, emotionally resilient. Talk about why you did this and, and the general premise. That's right. The, the science is amazing, Dr. Phil, because what we know now is what you do with your mind in very specific ways that are accessible to everyone can actually literally change many of the factors of health in your body. You can learn how to actually focus your attention with a practice a few minutes mm -hmm. a day that science has shown actually improves your physiology and actually grows aspects of your brain to make your brain function in a more nimble and resilient way. What do you mean grows your brain? I mean, literally, here's the amazing thing. What you do with your mind can get you to change both the function and the structure of your brain. The brain's anatomy changes with what you can do with your mind. So this can cause people to be able to do things next year they couldn't do last year. Exactly. So there's a simple phrase that I, I use, which is, where attention goes, that's how you direct your mind's focus. Right. Neural firing flows, which is the brain's activation, and neural connection grows, that's how you change the structure of the brain. So literally, what you do with a practice, creating a certain state of your mind, like focusing on something, okay, changes on. the structure of your Say brain. Say that again, because I'm yeah. going to steal that when you're not around. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Where your attention goes. Say that Where your again. attention goes neural firing flows, and neural connection grows. Okay, give a real world example. Yeah, so if you learn, let's say, to focus your attention, let's say, on your hearing or your sight. So I have this practice in the book called The Wheel of Awareness. The first two segments of the rim of a wheel, you're, you learn how to focus your attention on hearing, on sight, things like that. And as you do that, what you're doing is literally you're training the muscle of the mind that involves certain circuits to focus in, focus in, focus in. When you get distracted, you return your focus. And what research shows is it grows areas of the brain that allow the brain to literally create a more focused attention, of course, that's what you're practicing here, and it strengthens the connections in the brain. Literally, if you do a scan of the brain before and after, the brain has grown in helpful ways. Yeah, does that surprise y'all? I mean, seriously, this is amazing stuff. Mind blowing. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so next, so a, a wheel can change your life. Dr. Dan Siegel says his groundbreaking wheel of awareness can. We're going to find out what it is and how to use it after the break. <laughs> Closed captioning provided by. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Dan Siegel, who is sharing with us the incredible benefits of his life-changing meditation practice. Now, first, I want to debunk this ab about meditation, because yep. as soon as people hear that, they think, uh, woo, 
religious, spiritual, yeah. all of that. That's not what you're talking about no. here at all. No, the meditation only means strengthening the mind. It's a practice. Like if you go for a walk and you strengthen your leg muscles or you go to the gym and you work out your arm muscles, meditation is working out the muscle of the mind. That's all it is. And the wheel of awareness is actually a meditation practice. And the studies show it improves your immune system. It allows you to actually reduce inflammation, reduce stress, it improves the cardiovascular functioning. And amazingly, this blew my mind, it actually repairs the ends of your chromosomes. And when I sent the book out to the person who wrote a book with the Nobel Prize winning Elizabeth Blackburn in this area, she said, Dan, did it go to the printer yet? I said, well, not yet, why? What did I leave out? She goes, you need to say it slows the aging process. We're talking about uh, the wheel of awareness and uh, so here it is. We have a wheel with a hub, which represents being aware, and the rim, which represents all the things you be aware of. So here we have the first five senses on the first segment. That would be sound, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. Right. Then we move the spoke over in this practice. Okay. And then you're going to the next set of focused attention training. Now you're going inside the body to the feeling, for example, your gut sensations, your respiratory system, your breathing, your heart. And the studies are really clear. When you learn to develop awareness of the body, you get more intuition and amazingly more wisdom. So that's focused attention. You then take a deep breath. You move the spoke over one more time to the third segment of the rim. And this is the segment that includes mental activities like your emotions, your thoughts, your memories things like that. Mm -hmm. And amazingly, there you're developing what's called open awareness. You're just open to what is. And then you move the spoke one more time. And this is where it's our relationships, like the relationship between you and me, or you and your family members, or you and people who you work with, or your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And developing this relational sense expands the feeling of who you are. So it gives you a wider sense of belonging and connection. All right, and so during a, a meditation session, you would do what? You would work around this wheel? You could, if you memorize this, you could just move the spoke yourself with your visual imagery, mm -hmm. or if you listen to it on my website, you can actually go and right. listen to the recording. Either way, it's the same thing. What you're doing is distinguishing the hub of awareness from the rim, and then linking all these elements of the rim to each other. People are busy, yep. and they're going to say, well, it'd be great if I like, had a half a day to go do this, but it doesn't take that. We have a seven-minute version you can do. You might want to try it out slowly and get used to doing it. But even the image, Dr. Phil, of this, we have a, people use this in, in, in kindergarten. And I got a story of a boy named Billy where he's five and he had some trouble in another school, beat up a kid, came to the new school. And in this new school, the teacher teaches all the kindergarten kids the drawing of the wheel. And Billy comes to her the next day, she writes me an email, and she writes to me, Billy says, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, you gotta give me a break. I'm out on the yard, Joey took my blocks, I'm about to punch him, I'm lost on my rim, I gotta get back to my hub. Yeah, and, and this she, is five years old. Five years old, that's yeah. just as the idea. So yeah. you can practice it every day, you do the seven minute practice, but as you do, you actually distinguish this capacity to have the freedom of the hub. And that is a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, and, that's, and this is something everybody can do, and you just, you just need those few minutes to go sit down, focus on yourself, and do it. And look, I, this is amazing. I've read the book, and I, I really recommend that you read it. It's aware, the science, and practice of presence. So, Dan, thank you for doing this, and thank you for doing this. Thank you. I want Great to thank to all of my guests today. A special thanks to Dr. Dan Siegel. This book is available now. Everywhere books are sold. You can also go to drdansiegel.com to order a copy. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.